Okay, guys. What questions have you got from the morning's exercises? Either what I taught or anything else. No, I'm just kidding. Everything so clear? Bit by one of these flies or whatever, do you automatically get it? Or yeah, what is the um, what's the risk, the per bite, the biting efficiency of any of these particular factors? So in the case of the tsetse fly, very poorly, uh, very poor biting efficiency. And you can imagine why, right? They aren't spending time sucking your blood. It's just a quick prick and go. So uh, most, maybe 90 plus percent of tsetse's in an endemic area are uninfected. And the per bite risk is incredibly small too. Um, I think this is why you can have people get bit left and right and have such a relatively low incidence rate, if you will. Uh, in leishmaniasis, it's felt to be substantially higher. And why do we think so? You know, there's folks who do bring this home as a travel as an issue. So we know they were in Bailey's, they were bitten just for that one week, and now they've come home and they've, they've got this infection. So we think that it's higher. But with respect to Chagas disease, harder to tell. You think it'd be very small because it's about defecating and then scratching yourself. So if you wear that stuff or put your clothes in that stuff. So what I do is that, yeah, I, if I'm, if I can do whatever I want, right? I'm just traveling. So yeah, I treat my clothes with permethrin and I'll wear DEET or, um, uh, you know, if you want to have someone get into lemon eucalyptus or uh, something else that they want to use, it's fine. Anything that's generally anything that's good for Mosquitoes will be good for other fighters, not necessarily so much for seeds. They are tough. That seems to be much better. That's what, yeah, I'm sort of told. They'll bite you through the. Because I think I've been bitten by those things before. They hurt. Yeah. 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 This way I'll try to stay roughly on time. So it says we're going to talk about Onco. So we're good to 2.45. We can do that. We can do that. <laughs> what I'm teaching you should take six weeks. Okay. So we're going to change over to the... We've gone from those parasites that are the single cell, the trypanosomes, leishmania. Now we're going to big boys. And you have heard this morning, if I'm not mistaken, about Asperis and some of the other gut worms. So this is... Similar flavor, but they are tissue worms instead. So we'll talk about tissue nematodes. I'm going to think about East Africa in particular. That's where I have a little bit of experience. But having said so, a lot of what we talk about will also have implications uh, this side of the pond. So again, remember this is our map of life. So we're skipping from the tissue bugs over here to the round worms. And the Latin name is nematode. Where that comes from, I don't know, but the nematode. They have this name because they're round worms. This is actually what they look like. They come in two broad flavors. There are intestinal nematodes, and that's what you talked about today. So we, I could ask you right off the bat, right? Ascaris, you talk about threadworms and worms. And, is this ringing a bell? Any other round worms that you talked about? Strongyloides, hookworms. So those are the gut round worms that you've already talked about. Uh, with respect to the intestinal nematodes. What we're talking about right now will just be the tissue nematodes. It can be confusing. As you recall, some of the intestinal nematodes will spend time going through your meat, like through your foot, and if you're a hookworm, or going through your lung with the ascaris. They're still considered to be gut worms because that's where they live as adults, in the human gut. These guys are different. They may spend a little time in the gut, but they're mostly in tissue. And they all share this general anatomy, which is that they're round and they look kind of like an earthworm. Some are very small, some are macroscopic. And as you recall from this morning, I bet, the males tend to have a spicule or a little curly cue, pigtail. That's what they use to inseminate the ovipore of the bee down. Let's just do a couple of cases. If you have any ringers in the audience, I want you to call out with your own personal experience treating these patients. So here's a 55-year-old uh, grandfather in Ghana. These cases have become profoundly less common than they were just a generation ago, even within this last generation. For so much of the history of West Africa, this was a very typical common situation whereby you'd have um, a person who has skin lesions that are intensely pruritic and itching, that is the nightmare itching, like some of you may have had 
I don't know, a little bout of uh, Arushiol, poison ivy or poison oak exposure. You know what that feels like. Imagine that continuously for decades. And in this particular case, uh, progressive visual loss ultimately leading to blindness. These photos are real. These are people who would be led to and from the fields or around the village by their grandkids because they had lost their sight. And the grandchild, very common scenario, would have the same uh, risk of progression to blindness in early life as the person he was leading to the fields. So this is river blindness. The technical term is onchocerciasis. Onchocerciasis is a worm infection of the human body, including the eye in some cases, definitely including the skin in many cases too. The way this happens is that you're bitten by a simulian fly. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And during the fly bite, as similar to the tsetse fly bite with sleeping sickness, out of the saliva of the fly come the infectious form of this worm. Teeny tiny little microscopic worms. These are called microfilarii, meaning small threads. Microfilarii. And the microfilarii get swept up into the human body. The adults will then grow and will live under the surface of the skin, within the dermis. And they form something called a nodule. A nodule is basically an orgy pit for adults. A couple males, a couple females, constantly having sex, swapping sperm and egg, living inside these nodules. And out of the females come little, more little babies. And those babies, more microfilarii, they will go throughout the system, waiting for another fly to come along, take a meal, and perpetuate the life cycle. So what that means is that in river blindness, it's the pathology is caused by the babies. The microfilarii are what make you sick. The nodule is the adults, and they're sort of disfiguring. I'll show you some pictures. It looks like a big goose egg on your head or on your belt line. But they're only disfiguring. They're not necessarily dangerous. It's the babies that drive this process forward. The picture of the distribution of onco, it's so classic for so many of the infections that we might talk about. It's a problem of Africa. And during slave trade, we think what happens was that during slave trade, the infection was brought to the so-called New World. And so, yes, onchocerciasis is here in Latin America as well, and I've worked with some colleagues who practice and have seen this in French Guyana, etc. Definitely much more prevalent and higher incidence in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we say that in Sub-Saharan Africa there are many who are at risk. The absolute number currently being infected on an annual basis is getting smaller over time, thanks to the success of Carter Center and others, which we'll talk about briefly. Nigeria, what's the most populous nation in Africa? No surprise, it's the most common place to see someone who still may have onchocerciasis. What's interesting is that we call it river blindness for good reason, I guess, but it's confusing because most patients do not have blindness. It's actually much more of a problem of the skin and the dermal structures than it is of blindness. But nevertheless, it is a leading cause of preventable blindness on planet Earth, and therefore, I think that's the only good thing about that is that it has gotten some attention, uh, which it wouldn't have had otherwise, I think, if it were just a problem of the skin. So what happens is you're bitten by this guy. So this is the buffalo gnat, or the black fly, the simulium fly. And unlike the mosquito, which you'll study presently, where the larvae need to be on the surface of still water, that's where they breathe. These guys are different. They will pupate and grow under the water. Uh, it's safer for them because there's fewer birds that can come along and pluck them from the surface. The advantage is that they're safer growing up under the water in these little pods. The disadvantage is there's less oxygen tension in the water. And so the observation has been made over time that there's higher incidence of these flies in areas of turbulent water or fast moving rapids, if you will. And we think that's because as the water is more turbulent, there's more oxygenation of that water. It's part of the idea, again, of this being so-called river blindness. These vectors grow up in the rivers, and so if you're living close to the river, you're more likely to become bitten and therefore infected. It is a low efficiency vector. There are pool feeders. They take a bite out of you. They let the blood flow into that wound, and they lap up some of that sort of like Hannibal Lecter with the fava beans slurping up the blood. And so that's uh, generally what's happening with this particular pathogen. Now, we don't understand why this happens, but there are two uh, distinct patterns uh, of disease in Africa. There are probably two different species of worms. Intriguingly, we still don't have the answer, and some of the whole genome sequencing that needs to happen hasn't yet happened. 
But I can tell you that the doctors and the people who live there have observed this to be true, that there's a West African disease, and in West African condition, there tends to be more ocular disease. Uh, there are some areas where this is absolutely an extremely common issue, and that even by uh, their 20s, people would have a significant number of ocular involvements, and not unusual in those populations to have blindness in early age in the 30s or 40s, even into the 50s. However, in the forest, things seem to be a little bit different. Instead of the savanna pattern, if the river is going through the forest, observation has been that eye disease is less common, skin disease predominates. And in fact, this is more common in Africa than otherwise. And so if you just go into these communities and ask people, how do you feel about your skin? What's happening with your skin? Are you itchy or not? A significant proportion of people have very, very profound itching as an issue for them. And they less likely have eye disease, and when they do, the eye disease tends to be less anterior, um, more posterior. So, is it possible there's two different strains of this infectious agent, Oncocerca volvulus? Yeah, I think that's likely the case. What's interesting is that the West African varieties have more of the Wolbachia. What is Wolbachia? Who's heard of this stuff? This is a creepy story. In fact, it's so cool, I can hardly stand it. It's so exciting. Wolbachia are a species of bacteria, actually a family of bacteria, and they live in insects. If you cut open an insect, any mosquito running around out here, they will likely have something in this family of bacteria. They are to biting insects like E. coli are to be They're normal, healthy part of their gut flora. They're the microbiota of the insects. Intriguingly, these worms have evolved to take up some of that Wolbachia from the time of infancy inside the fly's belly. When they are microfilarii, they get colonized with that Wolbachia and they take it with them forward throughout the rest of their lives. And that's important because it helps us with respect to our treatment and prevention strategies too. I'm going to come back to that issue, but I just want to raise that idea that micro, microbiological flora human microbiome is something you'll hear a lot about moving forward. These guys have their own microbiome, and sometimes we can harness that to our own um, advantage. Whether it's possible that West African bugs are different because they have more Wolbachia, we simply don't know. It may, may be just an association, but it is an observation. So, how do these people present clinically? What happens? During acute infection, they're sick, right? They'll have musculoskeletal pain, arthralgias, backache, uh, weight loss, everything which is so totally nonspecific. You ask people just walking down the street in Denver, half of them have one of those things, right? So it's darn difficult in most cases to say, ah, this patient at this time has just been acutely infected with onchocerciasis. Typically, we're looking at these patients after they've been infected to see how they're doing in terms of the prevalence, but the incidence has been difficult for us to, to harness. What is clear is that patients who have chronic infection will often have skin manifestations. I'm not a dermatologist, I don't really understand the skin, but what I can tell you is that these patients are suffering tremendously. And what, what's been seen clinically is that there is a lichenification or a thickening, a hardening of the skin. Sometimes this is referred to as a, lipid, a lizard skin because the skin gets rough. In some cases, these patients have scratched so much that they have uh, knocked out the melanocyte producing cells, and you can end up with a melanocyte dropout pale pallor of the skin, leading to so-called spots. They're not spots of the skin, it's some parts of the skin that are normal, and the rest that have been scratched into oblivion. And this is sometimes called the leopard skin. Uh, and um, in both cases, I think it's pretty clear that it's the babies, the microfilarii, that are living inside the skin that is causing an intensely itchy reaction. Imagine this, in a sense, as an allergic reaction. There's an allergic antigen that's in the dermis, and it makes everything go crazy with respect to their Th2 response. And so, I don't know, I guess if I asked every one of us to scratch the volar surface of our forearm for an hour a day for the next 10 years, you can imagine what that spot of your skin is. We've all seen eczema. My gosh, most of you are pediatricians, you know this better than I do. The rash that itches, or the itch that rashes, right? So it's the same concept, but these patients have no relief. It's not a transient process. It happens day in and day out, and it's a source of tremendous misery. Uh, psychiatric illness, depression, inability to engage in work and social functions, etc. You can imagine how tough it is for these patients. And, 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 they're scratching with their fingernails. So what lives on your fingernails? Staph and strep and anything else. So secondary so-called super infections are also pretty common. 
So just some images to drive this home. Here's someone who's been scratching his buttocks. So there are raised, uh, bumpy, rough areas. And again, some parts of the skin doesn't project well, but these are areas that are probably tightly pigmented because the melanocytes have been scratched away, in effect. And often, as is the case here, the gentleman on the right, what you can see is that the areas of the greatest involvement are the areas that he can reach. So if it's a part of the body that he literally can't get to, the skin has a more normal appearance. It doesn't feel normal. It's just that he can't quite get to it as, as easily. I mean, I think if you were a clinician coming into a scenario where you're looking at someone on an individual basis, there's a few other things this could be. Norwegian scabies. I hate that term. I think the Norwegians hate it too. But we know what I'm talking about, right? Disseminated sarcoptes scabii infection in an HIV positive patient. That could look this way. A simple skin scraping will give you the answer there. I mean, a contact dermatitis over your whole body or lasting 30 years, I can't figure out how. There's not many other things that would drive this, in other words. I think this is what they're So remember, that's one way that it presents classically. And there are, there are also the nodules. Again, the nodule is the hive where the moms and dads are living in their orgies, making the little babies that are coming out and going to the skin. And um, what can I tell you? They, they are nodules towards the surface of the skin. Some studies at autopsy, in particular, that have been done, it's intriguing. It turns out that there are also deep-seated visceral subclinical nodules that are there as well. And there's an old rule of thumb, for every one you see, there's five that are deeper. I honestly don't know if that's true. I doubt it, actually. But the bottom line is, you can have just a single nodule and end up very sick. And most patients who are repeatedly infected over time have many, many nodules. The idea is that if you're looking at someone who has a big bump on the head, is that a lymph node? Did they fall down? Think in this proper clinical setting about the possibility of this being an adult hive, a den of iniquity for the adult worms. Now, in Africa, this tends to be on the bony prominences, in particular here on the iliac crest, and on the head, and in theory in the Americas, on the upper trunk. I was working on the course I teach in Africa. I was asking a, uh, one of our students, who's a doc uh, from Peru. He had seen very few cases, and in his experience, the nodules he was seeing were on the head, not the trunk. The classical teaching is that maybe there's something different. I'm not sure that that's true, although it is in the classical. <clears throat> this is what the nodules look like. And if you were to slice into one of these, you'd see the adult worms, which are macroscopic, uh, kind of like a strand of spaghetti, if you will, uh, and a whole bunch of them living together. And this is what they can look like here towards the iliac crests. It really doesn't project, but the bottom line is you might at a glance think, oh, this patient has lymphadenopathy, much more superficial, much more firm, and not in a classical inguinal position, but superior to that right over the bony prominences. Now, the lymphatics can also be involved in onchocerciasis. And what happens in the lymphatics is that you may have transient blockage of a lymphatic drainage. We'll talk about this with respect to loiasis, but it happens in onchocerciasis too. Sometimes it's called equatorial arm, where a patient will come in and the whole arm will look edematous. Just one arm, not the other. They're not the foot. They're not having congestive heart failure. They don't have quash. They just have a swollen arm. Probably what's happening is that there's an immunologic response to the microfilariae that have somehow gotten into the lymphatic drainage of that extremity. And you'll have a transient short-term swelling of the arm that then goes away. It calls into question this diagnosis. It also calls up the possibility of loa loa, which we'll talk about shortly. Having said so, that's the good news. The bad news is that if that happens time and again, over a long enough period of time, you can have actual damage, not just inflammation, but scarring and destruction of the lymphatic channels. And in some cases, even the lymph nodes themselves may become so engorged with the microfilariae that by time they start to fall down. This is called a hanging groin syndrome. Um, and it's, it's not a good look for some of these patients. The reality is someone with that much inguinal lymphadenopathy, perhaps there's other things it could be. Ah, this is clearly very chronic. All the elasticity of the skin has gone away, and these groins actually groins, meaning lymph nodes, actually start to fall down over time. So that's the skin story. And then, of course, there's the eye story, because although it's less common, of course, it's a tragedy for those who are involved. So we think that this happens when the microfilariae, the babies, go through the eye. It could be the front of the eye, the middle, or the back of the eye. Any of these is possible. And in fact, um, in some cases, the, when the surface of the eye is involved, you can actually end up with uh, scarring of the surface, right? A keratitis, a corneal inflammation. When the lens is involved, you can end up with someone who doesn't perceive light. 
and that can actually lead to optic atrophy. The optic disc is fine, it just has, literally hasn't seen light in all that time, so it starts to shrink away. That's a little different from when the retina itself, macula or otherwise, is directly involved in inflammation. Any of them can cause visual loss, and they're not all reversible, depending how quickly you get to them. So here's somebody who's got corneal opacification. Microfilariae have gone through the surface of the eye, and that's led to inflammation, uh, clouding, and damage. So here's someone who has uh, loss of the sharpness of the optic disc. Uh, so optic atrophy is there, and I'm so not an ophthalmologist, but if you look at the surrounding uh, tissue of the retina, you can see that there's actually inflammation and scarring there too. So the nerve is shot, the front of the eye can be shot, and the nerve, uh, all the apparatus of the retina can also be involved as well. There's optic atrophy. The retina looks fine, but the optic nerve is shot because the anterior eye was scarred early in life. So I want you to think about onchocerciasis. If you're working in, in an endemic area, you have someone who either has an individual patient or on a population basis, if you're wearing your public health and prevention hat, comes in with this constellation of symptoms. If you're thinking about this, start with the skin. Uh, I want you to do skin snips and take a look at the skin. Would you be willing to tell us how to do a skin snip since you've done how many thousands of them? Yeah, you just uh, take a little 22 gauge needle, slip it under the surface of the skin, usually over a uh, bony prominence like the scapula, and just cut very thin with a sharp razor blade. And if you do it that way, just the surface, it should be almost bloodless, bloodless. and almost painless too. Yep. So it's hard to believe you can go out for somebody with a knife and no anesthesia, even little kids, but this is the way it's done. The other technique I've seen is to use a scleral punch biopsy. Yeah. It looks kind of like a nail clipper. And you take a snap. Razor blades are cheaper. Razor blades are way cheaper and easier to clean too, by the way. Good, so I like that. <laughs> okay, excellent. So the idea is that what you'll do with that little hunk of tissue that she's got, which has dermis in it, you can put that into a small uh, tube, a pot of saline, and let it sit overnight. And if there are microfilariae in the skin that she's biopsied, they're going to swim out and end up in the saline as well. You can give that a quick spin, even a hand crank centrifuge, take a look at it and see what you got. Um, you can also, of course, do formal pathology, where you fix it and slice it and look at it under a stain, but that is very rarely practical uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I would say if you are of an ophthalmologic bent, take a look at the eye, obviously. Any portion of the eye, as I said, can be involved. Now, in some cases, you'll have access to a culture counter. This is a rare thing. It's becoming more common, and culture counters are really getting to be astonishingly portable and small. It's actually exciting. You can actually get a CBC in places where, I don't know, a generation ago it would be unthinkable. If you do, you can actually check patients' eosinophil counts. Very common for them to have a hyper eosinophilia. In gut worm infections, you'll rarely see a high eosinophil count. In meat or tissue worm infections, they're often high. And this is a perfect example. These patients should have high eosinophilia, trying to deal with all these microfilariae. It's not effective, but it sure makes the patient itchy. So, yeah, remarkably painless. I'm glad to hear you say that you had this good experience. I have some people who have not done many of these who are very scared of doing the skin snips because it just sounds like it would be so awful. But the reality is that if you have a little practice, it can go very well indeed. Uh, so. And that's what those so-called scleral punches look like. But I really prefer the idea of a little needle and a little razor blade or scalpel to get that done. And again, taking a look for the microfilariae, if under the microscope you see these guys, you have your diagnosis. Um, in fact, um, if you look at a microfilarium from a skin snip, uh, you can actually make a species ID as well. Now, I don't expect you to remember this for this particular course, but if you're working uh, in these endemic areas, it's worth taking a look at this. If you look at the end of this microfilaria, you look at the tail, you should be able to know whether that microfilaria has a sheath or not. A sheath is just the egg that they were born from. Some worms wriggle out of their eggs, some keep them on top, like a total body condom for the rest of their lives. Uh, so you'd say, does it have a sheath or not? And are there any nuclei in the tail? So this guy has no sheath, he's got no nuclei, it's oncocercovolvulus. I'll show you some different examples of other microfilaria in a moment. So it's great. You just made a biopsy very, very cheap uh, and generally safely and well tolerated. Having said so, in theory, if you see somebody with one of these nodules on their head, you can also cut that out. You don't 
have to do that to make the diagnosis. I think you would do that if you weren't thinking about onchocerciasis and you were looking for a lymph node or a foreign body or something like this. If you do cut out a nodule, sure enough, you'll end up seeing those adults that are in there. And that's okay. It's just you end up giving the kid a scar. You shouldn't have to go ahead and go after those nodules in most cases. So if you were to look in one of these nodules and send it to the pathologist, is it a tumor? It's not a tumor. It's, it's worms, right? And this is what they look like. Actually, these are adult worms that have been cut across. Let's zoom in. Yeah. So these, the adults, the females in particular, they are baby-making factories. They're absolutely packed with microfilariae. And in fact, here you can see some babies that have crawled out into the skin. They're getting ready to get out of that nodule and start swarming through the bloodstream again very effective and they make just scans and thousands upon thousands of these babies uh, over the many years of their adult lives. So a slit lamp exam we talked about, there are these characteristics of a punctate keratitis. I, I feel like my sense is that if I were going to spend a significant amount of time in Africa, I'd want to get smart about the eye because eye disease is such a huge source of morbidity and there are certain simple things that you can do. I'm not the person to teach it to. In fact, I'd want to have you work with a true ophthalmologist. I've worked with several in Tanzania. They are great. And I always feel like I need to spend about a year trying to get inside their head just to read their notes, much less to understand what they're doing with, with clinical care. But having said so, if you are going to spend time looking at these guys with a slit lamp, it may be helpful to study your textbooks before you go, so to speak. Finally, there's another way to make this diagnosis. If they don't have anything in the eye, they're itchy, but you can't get anything on a positive skin snip, you can actually go ahead and do a so-called so DEC patch test. DEC is DEC, that's diethylcarbamazine. That's the drug that's often used in treatment of other infections. The problem with this particular infection is that if we give DEC to these patients, we can cause tremendous harm. We don't want to give it PO because it can cause that jerish herxheimer reaction. We call that the Mazzotti reaction. It's bad news. So we'll talk about it. Somebody came up with the idea that we can get just a little bit of the DEC. It's going to kill just the microfilariae that are here in the skin, a patch of DEC. Some of my colleagues in London do this all the time, and they find it to be helpful. I've never run this test, but it is one of those things that's in the textbooks. And what's interesting is that if you take this solution of DEC and put it on the patient, and you get a big welt, what looks like a bee sting, if you will, the implication is, ah, maybe they've really got onchocerciasis. However, some people are just allergic to DEC, and so maybe they're having a chemical reaction to that patch test. Not used clinically on a, on a common basis. So I think eosinophilia is suggestive. I love checking eosinophil accounts. Oh, it's my favorite thing. And when they're negative, I think, well, it could certainly still be a parasite. And when they're positive, I think, oh, it could totally be not a parasite. So it's just one of those things where the negative and positive predictive values are not super helpful. The last patient I saw with a high eosinophil count of 11,000, you know, she had asthma. She had badass asthma. She was untreated. She wouldn't take her inhalers. She'd been walking barefoot in, in uh, Kibera in Nairobi. I was just sure that she had um, strongyloides infection. It totally wasn't. She just had asthma. So the point is eosinophils do not equate with parasites, and that's true here as well. There is a lovely serology test we can do for onchocerciasis, and um, what can I say? Uh, Peter Nutman, uh, who's at uh, NIH, has a terrific lab that looks at this. If you ever want to send any kind of filarial serology, do it at the Nutman lab. Not only because it's free, but also because he's a really sweet guy. He'll talk to you up, he'll hold your hand over the phone and say, your patient totally does not have a parasite infection, or whatever the case may be. So I like him very much. Uh, the reality is most people don't have access to that level of diagnostic care, and they certainly don't have access to PCR. So I've run this on sort of an experimental basis before. Some labs have this, most labs do not. You're still going to be stuck with those old school skin snip tests, which are still quite reliable. So again, the Mazzotti test is where we give a small dose of DEC and see if the patient gets sick. The reason we don't like this is because the DEC is so lethal to the worms, they may all die at the same time, causing an inflammatory allergic type reaction, making the patient super sick. So it's not something that we typically recommend. Although you'll read about it in the textbooks, please don't do that. So how do we treat? If we're not going to give DEC, what can we give that will kill the worm, but hopefully won't kill the patient at the same time? And the answer seems to be, at least on a mass public health type basis, that we often treat these patients with ivermectin or mectazam. So who, who can tell me the story of ivermectin in sub-Saharan Africa? How did that 
play out. Anybody read about this? It's an interesting topic. Ivermectin, and perhaps you'll talk more about this on Thursday. Ivermectin is uh, a veterinary medication. It's been used for parasites in horses for quite some time. In fact, apparently it's very effective. I'm not part of the horses set, but apparently horses are packed full of parasites. They get them and they eat the hay and stuff, and you want to make them run the Kentucky Derby. It's not good. So there's a whole industry, and very profitable, killing parasites in the horse's guts. Well, it turns out also to have benefits in human health. And as is so often true, this is a medicine that we've borrowed from veterinary medicine to use for human health and disease. And so, you know, it's been known for quite some time that ivermectin can be effective, not so much to kill the adults, but to kill the babies. And so, um, the story that I'm told is that Jimmy Carter was riding an airplane with the person who ran Merck. And they were looking down at parts of West Africa, verdant fields, fertile land, beautiful areas, abandoned villages, empty. And the question was, why aren't people living here? And the answer was, because there's river blindness. No one can live here anymore. This is, this, we could feed half of Africa with this piece of property, but no one could go back. But, you know, we do have this medicine that you guys make called ivermectin. Wouldn't it be great if we could use this? One dose of ivermectin for every person, roughly every 6 to 12 months, will dramatically suppress their microfilarity. So their risk of eye damage, the feeling that they have of itching, is dramatically reduced. Mass drug administration is very effective. At least this was the theory. Never been tried before because this stuff is so freaking expensive. And I won't go into the details, not only because I don't know all the details, but because it's embarrassing for Merck. But bottom line is, these guys eventually were guilted or shamed into finally stepping up and giving away ivermectin. And they have, to this day, to their credit, an amazing charitable program. Any Ministry of Health in Africa that wants access to ivermectin can have it. And they'll give them all the doses they want to give a dose to every man, woman, and child in affected areas every six to 12 months. And which has got to be one of the biggest feats of largesse, corporate largesse I've ever heard of. The analysis that I've heard is that uh, actually by doing that, they lose roughly one day of profit per year because they make so much money giving it to all these racehorses around the world. When I prescribe this, when I see patients with this infection, when I prescribe a single dose of ivermectin, it's something like 160 bucks for a day or something like this. So they still make plenty of money. I'm glad they do what they do. I don't feel so bad for them. That's all I'm going to say. So the excitement here is that if we periodically treat people, we'll kill the babies, but we won't necessarily get the adults. You have to keep that process up, at least until the adults die, at least until the whole natural cycle of infection burns out. At least that's the idea. So why don't we do this throughout all of Sub-Saharan Africa? Why doesn't every person get a dose? The issue is the next worm we're going to talk about, called Loa Loa. Worm so nice they named it twice, Loa Loa. So with Loa Loa, there is an observation that on rare occasion, not commonly, but rarely, some patients who have both Loa and Onco can get into trouble for some reason that we don't understand. If you have Loa Loa and we give you Ivermectin, it can cause an encephalitis. It can help to facilitate the entry of Loa Loa into the patient's central nervous system, or at least into the CSF. Although the reports are very few and far between, and the autopsy proven links are like two out of all the hundreds of billions of doses that we give. This is a concern, and it's one of the impediments to getting everyone treated for onchocerciasis over time. So, what do we do on an individual patient basis? You can either test them like I do, do you have loa loa or not, uh, or you can actually treat them with a different strategy. So this strategy of uh, doxycycline, especially doxy plus albendazole, that's attractive. Well, albendazole is a worm drug. You've probably heard about that for what's a great drug, for example, for aspirus, right? Why would we give doxycycline to these people? What's up with that? Because last I checked, that's an antibacterial antibiotic. Not for their acne. For their wolf bucky? For their wool back, yeah. yeah, you're trying to nuke the guts of these worms. So what you're doing is you're taking mom and dad worm in those nodules and you're sterilizing them. You're taking away their God-given <laughs> microbiota. And once they don't have that microbiota, they can't reproduce. They're less horny. They're less active. Eventually, they wriggle up and die. Think about yourself without E. coli. I mean, how you wouldn't enjoy the pizza or the sandwich you just had. It's like this. And so it's a very sexy idea. It requires daily treatment for weeks, perhaps six weeks of doxycycline. So I like this a lot. If you could take everyone in Africa, 
give them all doxycycline every day for six weeks, this whole problem would go away. You can just imagine all the many reasons why that is totally friggin' impossible. Because it's toxic, they'll have esophagitis, they'll have some phototoxicity, it can't be done. But that's the definitive way to do it. So with doxycycline, you kill the parents, there's no more babies, and the whole process goes away. With ivermectin, you kill the babies, but the parents are still upstairs getting busy. This is the problem. Okay. So ivermectin, given every periodically, and in fact, in some cases, even as often as every three months. Doxycycline every day for six weeks, and we would then chase it with ivermectin as a common way to do this. And again, we're trying to go after the Wolbachia, as you said. Now, there's other medicines that may be coming down the pipe for this. There's something called moxidectin, something called clozantel. I have no personal experience with these experimental drugs. I'm not sure we need them. I think we need better ways to implement ivermectin treatment. And yes, I shouldn't belittle the nodules. If someone has a problem like the nodules rubbing against their belt, cut out the nodule. There is a practice or a, a sort of, well, it's a practice. I don't know what it's based on. But the idea is that if you have a nodule on the forehead, maybe you have higher risk for blindness because babies are more likely to go right from the nodule out to the eye. I'm not clear that that's true, but it is a practice that has been embraced in Africa, and it seems to be well tolerated generally. I think the story of onchocerciasis is the story of prevention, and it is such an interesting story with respect to Merck donating those doses of medications. The organization that I know of is the African Program for Onchos uh, Control, or APOC, and their idea is that if we can if we do this, if we can give 90 million people consistent dosing, then within the next couple of years, we should be able to get rid of onchocerciasis, truly get rid of it, uh, by 2015. We've already given away tens of billions of doses, not nearly as many as they should or want to, but, but there it is. Again, sustainability uh, and endurance and stick to itiveness, that's what we really need here. And by the way, what do we do about the vectors? Yeah. You can put these fish into the water that eat the larvae. It's kind of a cool thing. I think what happens is that they eat all the larvae, then they get hungry, and they either die or they start eating other stuff. It's not necessarily a sustainable solution, but this has been tried. So that's onco. Okay. Onco circa volvulus. Two flavors, a savanna flavor and a forest flavor, one with eye, one with skin. You're going to make a skin, slip, uh, skin snip or slit lamp diagnosis. Try to reduce the symptoms. Ivermectin is the watchword. It doesn't deal with it definitively, but it stops the itching, if you will. The only caveat, watch out for low, low, and I'll tell you about that presently. Periodic mass drug administration. Any questions about Onco? Yeah, please. The skin snip, does it matter where you do it? Yeah, does it matter where you do the skin snip? The teaching has been to do it over a bony prominence. And you had mentioned the scapula. I like that. I've heard people doing it uh, here over the crests. Uh, and I don't know if, I don't know why. We've always said that that's where the, where the nodules are more likely to be. This is a little bit different. I'm not sure if that's where it's better tolerated or what the story is. But that's exactly why I've seen other people do it in Africa, too. But in theory, it shouldn't matter where you do it. Because those worms, if it's truly a heavy infection, the microflurry should be everywhere. But that has been the teaching that's been passed down. I like the idea of the back because there's not as many nerves in the back, you know. Arbor is less. I think that's probably as good a reason as any to go back there. Okay, so let's change it up. So we're going to be fine, guys. We're changing priorities. I took this photo when I was doing my trot med training in London. It's a traffic sign. I have no idea. <laughs> in fact, I show this to people from London. They're like, yeah, I have no idea what that is. But we're going to change priorities. We'll talk about low low. Worms so nice they named it twice. So in Loa Loa, we have something slightly different, but analogous in many ways. Alcocerciasis. Again, vector-borne, transmitted by the bite of a fly, not the black fly, but something called a deer fly. I'll show you the picture in a moment. And during the blood meal, the deer fly squirts a little bit of saliva into your subcutaneous tissues. In the saliva are microfilarii, microscopically small worms. These baby worms get into your system. They grow up into adults, and then they wander around inside of you, looking for love. That's what we all want, right? They want romance, they want to find their soulmate, and they just cruise through your system. And occasionally, they'll uh, find their way, they'll actually make microfilarii, and once in a while another chrysops fly comes along and takes a bite. They don't live in nodules, they don't like building a house, they like to travel the world, your body. 
And that's where the pathology comes from. So it's interesting. I want to emphasize this. In Loa Loa, humans by themselves, just like in Onco, humans are not enough to complete the life cycle. It's a recurring theme in tropical medicine. Very rarely are humans alone enough to complete the life cycle. Strongyloides is the exception. Did you talk about strongy this morning? That's the one Mac Daddy gut bug to know your strongyloides, because you will see strongy. If you're like me, you'll get it wrong and you'll kill people. So don't blow up with strongy. These guys are different. They actually need to get back into the fly to complete their life cycle. So, strongyloides uh, is a different story. We'll talk about that maybe another time. With Loa, I want you to focus on Africa. It doesn't seem to be in the so-called New World. It is centered in West Africa and part of Central Africa as well. It's a smaller number of infections by comparison to onchocerciasis. The reality is that it's sort of a disease looking for treatment, if you will. We, there's not a lot of active case finding in many communities around Loa, except those areas where there's also onco, because we don't want to get it wrong with Loa and onco. So in a sense, I'm not clear how much Loa Loa is out there, um, but it's probably significantly less than we see in onchocerciasis. And over time, you're sort of the longer you live, the more likely you are to have a Loa infection. You get this by the bite of this fly. It's got these big iridescent um, eyes. It looks sort of like Bono when he was in his fly phase back in the 90s, you know, these big googly eyes. And it goes by other names too, deer fly or horse fly. It breeds in the canopy and then lays its eggs down in the swamp. So it doesn't go to the savanna. It needs forest cover. And that's why this is a problem of forested areas of West Africa and not so much uh, far eastern Africa. So why do they make you sick? Usually they don't. Most people with Loa Loa have no symptoms at all. That's the whole point. Most people just carry these worms with them for their wives and don't have an issue, except on rare occasion, that creepy morning when you look in the mirror and there's a worm crawling across the surface of your eye. This generally gets people's attention. With that one exception, most people don't realize that they have a problem here at all. Totally different from what we see in onchocerciasis. In onco, it's the babies that cause disease, not the grown-ups. In loa, no one has ever caused sickness that we know of from the babies. It's the adults that sometimes creeps people out. And it's as they move through your meat that you get into trouble. So that's a little bit different. Um, once in a while, uh, when the moms give birth to these microfilarii, they can cause trouble with what we would call a calabar swelling, but it's not that big a deal. I'll show you this. So most people with loa loa, asymptomatic. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, and um, so although people get creeped out by it, no one ever died of low loa, unless we gave them ivermectin for their onchocerciasis, right? So what does it do in the eye? It's sometimes called the eye worm. Not the blinding worm, but the eye worm. And that's because occasionally it'll crawl across the surface of the eye, or at least just under the surface of the eye. They actually don't stick on the surface itself. They're usually under the bulbar conjunctival, just one or two cells deep. But they can be seen, and over a matter of uh, perhaps an hour, they'll travel across the surface of the eye. Why do they do this? We don't know. We ask them, they don't tell us. My sense is that they're doing this constantly throughout your entire body, going everywhere. And once in a while, they happen to stumble across the eye. That's all. Uh, it's fascinating. They may only happen in minutes. You can imagine how this would get someone's attention. Now, this photo is a little misleading. This is a low, low worm, and the eye surgeon has made a nick in the uh, cornea. And so the worm has actually crawled out truly onto the surface. But I show you the picture anyway, so you get an appreciation for how big it is. So you can understand why people rarely forget their low, low experience. Now, having said so, the other way this shows up is something called a calabar swelling. And a calabar swelling is just like that equatorial arm of onchocerciasis. So part of the lymphatics become blocked or inflamed, and you end up with a swollen arm, for example. And this, who knows why this happens? The worm, the adult is farting or urinating or making babies in your lymphatics. We don't know. Something is causing an inflammatory reaction in the lymphatics, and therefore you get transient blockages, usually hours, sometimes as long as a couple of days. And in fact, um, these uh, patients may have an eosinophilia. Actually, sometimes they don't. So here's an example. It doesn't show so well. Look at the hand here. You can see the knuckles and the veins of the hand, right? That's normal. And here's someone where it looks like he's got congestive heart failure or something like that. This is a traveler who came back with Loa Loa. And this calabar swelling will be there just for a matter of hours or days. I would emphasize, finally, one of my favorite teachers, Tom Doherty from London School, tells me that he did take care of a gentleman who had chronic fatigue, 
after working in Africa for many years, and uh, all they could ever find was Mauna And once every few years, a worm would crawl across the eye, he would run into his surgeon and they'd pluck it out. And after they plucked out, I think the 13th adult, he said he was cured and right as rain. And so who knows whether, and he also had a low level eosinophilia that was percolating along. I don't think this is the answer that all the chronic fatigue patients are looking for, <laughs> but it can be associated with that, at least with this one particular case. So I, yeah, I would emphasize on very rare occasions you'll actually have true disease with low. Yeah, it's a worm in your body. It can drive eosinophils high. You've heard of hyper eosinophilic carditis or pneumonitis. This can happen, but it's distinctly unusual in this particular process. The big issue with Lola is don't blow it with those people who have who are getting treated uh, with anti-infective medications, especially after ivermectin. It says DEC, it should say, especially after uh, ivermectin. So what are we talking about? How you make a diagnosis? A patient comes in and says they had a worm crawling across their eye. They're either crazy, they're crazy, or they have low low. It could be. So ask them if they travel to an uh, appropriate area. Calabar swellings should also be on your list there too. So you can check their blood film and they should have a daytime pattern of microfilaremia. It's because those flies, the deer fly, it bites during the day. And so it's more evolutionarily advantageous, a good fitness adaptation for the microfilaria to brave that very violent environment of your bloodstream during the daytime. So grab a daytime blood smear. And here's another example. Here's a microfilaria, right? So we take a look at it. Take a look at the tail. Does it have a sheath? It's hard to tell from where you're sitting. It totally has a sheath. Look at that. It almost looks like a, I don't know, like a capsule on an Indian ink prep from somebody with cryptococcus or something. So this does have a sheath. It has nuclei that go all the way to the tip. That's a little low. This is the sort of thing you can, instead of memorizing, can always look up on a guidebook. That's easy for us to do. So we also do have a serology for this. Again, the Nutman lab is the best one to use. The serology portion that I like best is called IgG4. It's more specific for the different species of microfilaria. Uh, unfortunately, once you're positive, you're always positive, and it won't help you tell whether someone's truly actively infected or just has a prior history. And eosinophilia, it's there sometimes, potentially suggestive if it's present. It won't get you out of having to uh, consider doing a serology as well. So, how do we treat? You usually don't have to treat. It usually is a harmless process, not necessary to treat. Unfortunately, these guys don't have uh, those crazy Wolbachia. And so doxycycline may not actually get us where we want to go. At least we don't think that's true. So if you want to go ahead and grab the eye, that's OK. You will not be blinded by the worm. It's not sight threatening. It's only threatening to the, the sleep patterns of this person who has the heebie-jeebies because they just had a worm go across the eye. <laughs> and you'll hear about people going after the soft tissues. Oh, there's a calabar swelling. You must have a, an adult somewhere in your lymphatics and exploring the extremities surgically. This is a catastrophe. I do not recommend this. We'll see it in the textbooks. I just don't understand why you would do that because you threaten their lymphatics or their nerve system, etc. It should not be required. <laughs> one of my friends in London tried to do a PET scan on one of these folks. No one knows where the worms go, and so the theory was if we gave FDG or fast glucose PET, we could see it light up on a PET scan. And uh, this was in Britain. They have something called the National Health Service over there. Where I work, the PET scan is so friggin' expensive, I can't even order one of these things. So how they did this on the NHS, they pretended he had lymphoma or something. And they said, oh, let's scan this guy. They didn't see anything. Uh, although, intriguingly, he was a tall patient, and the camera cut off the top of his head and the bottom of his feet. So they were thinking of writing a letter to the Lancet saying, you know, finally, the location of Lolo established either the top of the head or the foot. <laughs> we don't know where these guys go. So extraction from the eye can be done surgically, as you can imagine. I, I do not recommend that you cut into somebody's mood to cut this thing out. So DEC is an interesting drug in these guys. If we treat patients with DEC, it kills the babies. It kills some, but not all of the adults. And unfortunately, we'll often have to retreat. So they're really, it's a fascinating story. Worms crawling through your body, 30% chance of killing them. 70% chance they just have to live out their natural born days, which in the case of Loa may be more than 10 years before they finally go away. And so on occasion, patients may actually get worse if they're given DEC. It's actually a much bigger issue uh, if they're treated concurrently with ivermectin as well. But we've seen this with DEC too. 
Probably what happens is if you're given DEC and you have a lot of microfilarii in your blood, you can have one of those classic George Herxheimer reactions. So the standard is to say, check the blood, how many microfilarii are there? Is it more than 2,500 per cc of blood or not? And if you have a lot of these, give little steroids first and then treat them. If there's not a lot of the babies, go ahead and give them their DEC anyway. Most practitioners that I know will just give a little bit of steroids and then give the DEC and hope for the best. That's sort of a typical way to do it. Now, when would you not want to do that? Patient with low LOA, I'm just going to give them a little Patient bit of DEC. Patient with strongylitis? Oh, you're worried that they may, they may actually have onchocerciasis too. Remember, because DEC plus onco, that's the Mazzotti reaction. So that's a problem as well. Strongyloides, yeah. I never get steroids to anybody who's got strongyloides. Good thinking. It gets a little complex, doesn't it? Just try to deal with these people on an individual basis. Good. There's many regimens for the DEC dosing. These are here for your subsequent regimen. I'd say regardless of what you choose, it's helpful to actually do a repeat uh, series of smears and repeat treatment if necessary if you fail to cure them. Having said so, again, you don't strictly have to treat these patients who have low aloha. Other drugs can work as well. Ivermectin is there too, and as we talked about, in some cases with ivermectin, we worry about encephalitis in those who also have cases of, um, of onchocerciasis. Because in theory, although you can give a dose of ivermectin, the truth is this may facilitate encephalitis in these patients, which is rare and controversial, but has been seen and seems to be real. It's just hard to predict when it's going to happen. In your question. Do you ever see uh, period protocols that would just have dosing at night when presumably the... Yeah, what about, what about the time of day for dosing? It's interesting. So in LOA, the microfilaria are more in the blood in the day. We'll talk about lymphatic filariasis in a minute. That's the reverse. That's at nighttime. I don't know anybody who doses that way. And I think the theory is whether or not you have microfilaremia detectable in the blood, in the tissue, they're still there. And where they hide, we don't know. I suspect that they're just not being born during the nighttime in this case. So it's an interesting question. Would it be possible to actually augment your killing potential by varying the time of the dose of the drug? Most of these medications have a really long half-life, and so it probably doesn't matter. At least that's the way we explain it away. But if you want to do a study, it would be cool. Other questions so far? Okay. I'm going to have my right side of hemming neglect. You guys must be thinking. So, bed nets are great. Love bed nets. Not for this, because these guys bite you in the day, but for malaria, great thing to do. Same thing for lymphatic filariasis. Unfortunately, there is no strong prevention for this. If you have people wear DEET, that may be helpful. If you live in Africa, you can't wear DEET every day of your life. It's hard to prevent these infections, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately. So, those are the key concepts around LOA. It's caused by the bite of a fly. The adult cruises through your body. Once in a while, it'll go through your eye, and that makes people creepy. Or it can cause a swollen hand, the calabar swelling. Uh, we'll make the diagnosis with a daytime blood film, and we can treat in a couple of ways. DEC is great, but if there's a high microfilaria load, we get concerned about Gerrish Herxheimer type reaction. Give a little steroids first, and um, surgical extraction if the opportunity arises across the surface of the eye. Should rarely be necessary. Patients are treated periodically with DEC, but again, we don't like to do that if they may also have onchocerciasis for the reasons we talked about before. I'm not clear what's going to happen with LOA. Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen with LOA. I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think it's going to become a bigger issue. I don't think it's going to be a problem with HIV infection. I think it's just there. And it's an infection of primates. It lives in chimpanzees and mandrills. And if you're one of these forestry people who studies mandrills, you're going to get this infection. That's what happens. And it's probably totally okay. So before the break, one more worm. Can you guys do it? Nice. Okay. So I always feel like this is your position, sitting still and writing down questions. Yes? It's okay to give DEC periodically, right? You just can't give Ah, so why, why can't we periodically give DEC? So it's interesting. You, you probably can. In fact, I'm going to give you slides right now that show you the DEC is an awesome thing to give on a mass administration basis. The reality is if you give a significant dose of DEC, to someone who has onchocerciasis, the first one we talked about, it can be a problem. That can cause a Mazzotti reaction, which is just Gerrish Herxheimer allergic reaction. So we would avoid that in anybody who has onchocerciasis. We would also avoid it in anybody who has a heavy, low infection, because we'd want to first get a little bit of steroids. 
My fantasy is probably that if you're ever going to give DEC, there should be a little bit of dexamethasone built in to try to tamp this down. It just hasn't been studied that way. And as you can imagine, it's not a good thing to put steroids in worms. But I'm about to show you slides right now on a different worm where that is exactly the strategy of what you're suggesting. It's used throughout Oceania, uh, Papua New Guinea, etc. And it goes great. They don't have onchocerciasis over there. That's the issue. I think it really comes down to this idea, guys, that it's so tough for you in a course like this where you're wearing these two hats. You're a clinician and you're also a global development public health person. Those are different, right? I see someone coming to see me in my clinic. I run the Trot Med Clinic at UW. Yeah, they have a case of onchocerciasis. I'll give them doxycycline. It'll be good. Kill the adults. We're going to get rid of the babies. I'll chase it with some ivermectin. You can't do that on a mass public health administration basis. So, sort of a fascinating conundrum. All right, let's do our last case. A 51-year-old farmer from Nigeria. Now, he has years of progressive edema of his scrotum. And this is him. And in fact, at a glance, you can see he's got this goose egg on his side. It looks like the world's worst mosquito bite. And of course, the reality is much worse. Um, this is what he's dealing with. I mean, if you can tear your gaze away from the obvious, please look at his left leg. Because this is all part of that same process, okay? Compare those two extremities and you can see what's actually going on with this job. Um, so this is filariasis. The technical term is lymphatic filariasis. The crude common term is elephantiasis. Filariasis is a bad term because these are all microfilarial infections, okay? But in the lingo of the profession, we call it filariasis. If you hear somebody talk about filariasis, they mean lymphatic filariasis, which is this infection. So it's several different disorders. There are several worms that do it, and they all behave in a relatively similar fashion. Okay? They're part of this overall super family of the filaroidea. The bottom line is they live in the lymphatics, they live in your subcute tissues, they can cause acute inflammation, and they can cause chronic dysfunction of the lymphatic systemic return as well. So the life cycle is pretty straightforward. You're bitten. In this case, by a mosquito, it's not a fly, it's not a gnat, it's a mosquito. The mosquito bites you out of the saliva, um, the microfilarii, infectious baby worms, they get sucked up into your system, they grow up into adults, and the adults move into your lymphatics. Now, I don't know why, I've asked them, they have not told me, they don't like to talk to me, but my sense is that they like the lymphatics because it's relatively uh, immune privileged, so they're not going to get beaten up by your spleen or your liver, and it's pretty rich. Right? If you look at uh, the chylus return of your meal, the sandwich you had for lunch, the lymphatics carry some of that nutrition, chylomicrons and all that stuff too. But I don't know why they do this. They seem to like it. And when they're in your lymphatics, boy meets girl, they have romance, they have sex, out come the babies. And the babies, the microfilarii, end up getting taken up once again by the next mosquito that comes along. So. Here's one of the many vectors of lymphatic filariasis. He likes chinkly fasciatus. So the culicines are these brown mosquitoes. You've got them here in Colorado. These are the nuisance mosquitoes, the ones that we see all the time. Um, and unfortunately, in some parts of the tropics, they can serve as vectors of this infection. It's a big deal because these guys are totally happy to breed in your latrine. They'll be happy to stay in a gutter, stagnant water around people's homes. They don't require, they're not lily white, they don't require pure streams, they don't require oxygenation, they can literally breed in human stool. And that means that where people are, people's waste is, where people's waste are, these mosquitoes come in. So this is not just a problem of the jungle, it's not just a sylvatic issue, this is a problem of human habitation. Not just limited to rural areas in Africa, but there are many other vectors that do this as well. But I think the point is that the vectors will vary place to place, some parts of Oceania, if you go to Micronesia, etc., you'll have island chains with one particular mosquito, and then you hop over to another island chain, it's a different one. That may be important to know as a public health person, because sort of like the Chrysops, the Loa Loa worm likes to be in your blood during the day, these babies like to be in your blood at night, or at least at the exact time when your local mosquitoes are likely to bite. That's their evolutionary co-fitness co process. And that means that if you're going to do surveillance testing, you need to know when the bugs are biting. When people are getting bitten by mosquitoes, that's when you want to do your blood films, because that's when you're more likely to get a positive test. So, Bucheraria bancrofti is the most common, but there's also Brugia malayi and Brugia timori. And the Brugian family is 
similar, but it happens, of course, as the name implies, more in Oceania and East Asia. In the Americas, in Africa, it's essentially Bancroftian filariasis. It's a global process. Any place in the tropics where it's warm enough for mosquitoes to live, you are at risk of acquiring this. And yes, that includes Latin America for people like me who love to go to warm places and relax. You're still at risk. There's still many areas, what we call skip areas, infected, not infected or not, which is sort of an interesting story, not totally clear why. Uh, we think that there are hundreds of millions of people who are infected, which is an unimaginably huge number. In Africa alone, it looks like close to 100 million people are infected, although, as you can see, any time the number goes from 40 to 90, it tells me that people don't really have any clue what's actually going on. But the numbers are big. So, how does this present clinically? A lot of these patients will be asymptomatic. I'll say it again, a lot of these patients will be asymptomatic. If you have filariasis, you don't necessarily have a scrotum to put into a wheelbarrow. It can be much more subtle, much more insidious. Uh, and that's the same as is true with onchocerciasis and with loiasis, um, generally speaking. And often we'll make the diagnosis based on a screening effort and not just on an individual case finding process. But, intriguingly, if you use an ultrasound probe to check the lymphatic chain of anybody who's infected, even subclinically, yeah, it's interesting. Many of them will have radiographic or sonographic changes. So it looks like there is some damage, some scarring, some inflammation, some damage to the lymphatic chain, even early on in infection. And that's so key, because it means that it's not the kind of disease we should sweep under the carpet and wait for people to come to us. It means that we should pay it forward, really do aggressive case finding, try to find these out deal with the lymphatics. Once your lymphatics are shot, everybody knows the story, right? A lot of your pediatricians. In the adult world, if you end up with lower extremity uh, cellulitis uh, due to strep, for example, if you don't deal with that right away, you'll have scarring of the lymphatics and then you're screwed because those patients will come back again and again. And every time they come back, there's more damage to the lymphatics, there's worse lymphatic return, they're more susceptible to strep. And the same is true with these poor patients as well. Um, so. How does this present clinically? Yet yeah, you may see patients with an acute adenolymphangitis, and these are people who are coming in sick. This is their first infection. They're having an immunologic response to the worm. Fever, rigors, chills, local pain uh, is described as well. And you'll have regional lymphadenopathy, maybe even a whole extremity that is inflamed and edematous. And it will eventually simmer down until it comes back again and then simmers down and comes back again in a cyclical pattern until finally the edema comes and stays. And by then we've blown it because once the lymphatics are screwed, we really can't seem to fix this so well. There's also some patients who have more of a skin manifestation than just the lymphatics. This can look for all the world like a bacterial cellulitis. What it is about that, some of these people have more skin homing of their immunologic response than others, but it absolutely does happen and again, they can look very, very sick indeed. Lymphatic obstruction. So, in lymphatic obstruction, it's about the adult worms living in the lymphatics that are causing mechanical blockage of your lymphatics. That's pretty much it. I think the story is probably more subtle. There's probably a big immunologic issue whereby some of these folks will have more of a T cell response and some more of a B cell response. I don't understand that story very well. All I can tell you is if you have a lymphatic channel chock a block full of worms, you're going to get into trouble with lymphatic obstruction. This is how I think of it. And that means that the downstream limb, the extremity, the scrotum, the breast, whatever, it has less ability to clear its lymphatic tissue. It's like the, I always explain this to the patients, it's like the sewer system during a flood. If you don't keep the, the sewers clear of the leaves, things will back up. It's very simple. And unfortunately, once that happens, secondary infection uh, is a common process, especially for people who aren't properly shooed or shot. And in some cases, unbelievably but truly, the lymphatics of the pelvis will be so dilated, get so big, that they will actually erode into the ureters. It's one of the classic presenting signs here is calurea. Calurea meaning you urinate and out comes what looks like whole milk. And this is well described too. So here's an example of someone who's got unilateral, persistent, progressive lower extremity edema or elephantiasis. So I'd emphasize, first of all, yeah, there's an asymmetry that's obvious. This leg's not normal. Uh, this person shouldn't have even this much edema. But by comparison, this one is much worse. And why that happens, I don't know. It's very typical that you'll have one extremity worse than the other. The skin that's here has very deep fissures and furrows. If you were to touch this patient, the skin would feel rough, uh, like the skin of an elephant. So technically speaking, 
Uh, elephantiasis refers to the skin change, whereas lymphedema refers to the general edema, although people don't use those terms that way. Here's a patient uh, in Micronesia. So she, again, she actually has bilateral disease, much worse on her right. And it doesn't take much imagination to figure out how much staph and strep is going to live in this area. She's not wearing shoes. She's probably high risk for protoconiosis, which is a whole different animal. Anyway, she needs to get into shoes. She needs to keep this area clean and dry and elevate her skin, or she will be in deep trouble with respect to, to infections. The genitals are involved in men and women, obviously. So if you were to take a biopsy of one of these lymphatic channels, you're going to prove to yourself that it's LF. God forbid it be a, a tumor of the pelvis, ovarian cancer or something. Let's say you actually do a biopsy. This is what you see. Adult worms, cut obliquely, cut across. We zoom in. This is what they look like. These guys are built for sex. Oh, that's all they do. So there's the body. The little circle over here, that's the gut. These are the twin uteruses, or the testes. They just they double down in their reproductive system, and they are just built to reproduce and make those microfilarity in hopes that the next mosquito that comes along will be able to perpetuate the life cycle. And you can imagine a lymphatic channel that's more worm than human, that's not going to be a good outcome. This is a lymphangiogram, which I've never seen. In the old days, they would do this where you take the person by the foot, and you take a razor and slice their foot until so you get down to lymphatics, and you cannulate their lymphatics and put in Barium? I don't know if they don't do this anymore, but that's what this used to look like. And then you actually snap a film as the contrast goes up, the ionated contrast. And that's what this is. So I don't have a normal to show you. It ain't supposed to look like this. I mean, the lymphatics of the pelvis should be very dainty, fine, lacy, and these are wildly dilated and tortuous. And so it's no surprise that you can get into trouble with this chyloneurea. So here's a patient who's peed in a cup, and out comes whole milk. And it's not only distressing the patient, you can imagine, those chylomicrons, those are tough to come by. I mean, you may only get a cheeseburger once a year or something if you're living in these areas. They need their nutrition. Nutritional status is borderline to start with. So it's just a shame for people to eat a meal and have it come out into the toilet without being absorbed, if you will. Now, there is something called the filarial dance sign, or FDS. And that's, I think it should be the name of like a boy's pop band or something like filarial dance sign. Let's see if it works here. Yes, good. Okay, so this is a physician in India who just shot this with his iPhone and taking a picture of his own ultrasound screen. So this is a scrotal ultrasound, and um, that's not normal, okay? <laughs> you shouldn't be able to see adult worms swimming through your scrotum. Uh, in fact, so the vas deferens could be involved. Um, but the seminal vesicles are often involved as well. And I think it even projects up there, you can see these worms that look like they are dancing. So that's a classic finding. One of my fellows called me about a year ago after I gave this talk. She said, oh my god, in the ER, there's this guy who just got back from his work in the Merchant Marines in Belize, and he's got this tender scrotum. They did an ultrasound to look for orchitis. They were worried about torsion. They said, there's something there's something moving. I said, is there something dancing? She said, yes, there's something dancing in his scrotum. And I said, oh, it sounds like classic filarial dance sign. <laughs> and uh, she said, and she was so excited. She almost had a cow right there. That was the coolest thing. Treated him with doxycycline. These guys do have Wolbachia. So you can try to kill the adults with doxy. And eventually they'll become sterile and the process will abate. She treated him with doxycycline. He never came back. I was actually out of town on the phone. When I got back, I looked at the ultrasound. It totally didn't look like this. It looked like um, looked like shifting sand in the night or something. It was much more subtle. So she had been seduced by this classic thing. It turns out that semen also shows up on the ultrasound, and that is a normal finding in the human scrotum. So he actually didn't have lymphatic filariasis. What he had was whatever it is that guys get when they're on shore leave from the Merchant Marine in, in, in Latin America. So he actually just had good old-fashioned epididymitis and STD, and so he was cured with the doxy cycle. <laughs> I love the doxy. At least for us in, uh, I gotta tell you, in Seattle we have a huge issue with doxy right now. Are you having this too? Your pediatricians don't even use this shit. I gotta tell you, in Seattle it's a big problem. It's become crazy expensive. A 10 day supply for $500 used to be 50 cents. Mm -hmm. We're now using minocycline instead because it's on shortage. It's just crazy. 
but I digress. So that's the bottom line. With respect to lymphatic filariasis, yep, there are microfilarii, but it's the adults that are causing the problem. We need to attack them aggressively, and so um, we've got to go after them. I would say because there are microfilarii, it's possible for these people to have an eosinophilia, a systemic inflammatory response to the microfilarii. It's possible for them even to have uh, a tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. You may have heard about this regarding ascaris. Was that covered today? When the ascaris actually goes across the lung, you can have a little infiltrate, some cough, a little bit of reactive uh, airways disease, perhaps even uh, an eosinophilia. These guys can do the same, but it's not nearly as common as we see with other particular infections. So I'll go through that. I think the key here would be to say, if you want to make a diagnosis of this condition, I want you to think about doing a blood film. That's one of the few things to take from this course. Make your blood film. It's always the right thing to do. Just make sure you do it at the right time of day. So here's some uh, healthcare outreach workers working. It's not just there's no flash. This is a nighttime photograph. They're working at night because that's when these mosquitoes bite. When the mosquitoes bite is, in fact, when you'll become microfilaremic. And so actually just taking a cc of blood, either spinning it first and then staining it, or just raw blood is the way to go. Now, the next question that comes up is, what do you do for your practice if you're doing travel medicine and you're seeing someone who comes back from overseas? How do you make a diagnosis? Because you want to know whether you want to do a daytime film or a nighttime film. Put another way, do worms get jet lag, right? How do you deal with that? <laughs> and... Um, Totally interesting story, but the bottom line is, yep, they totally get jet lag. It takes them about as long as it takes you or I to finish up our sleep-wake cycle. So uh, the truth is, if they've been back for more than a week, you could probably do it at nighttime again. And how they know when it's night and not day, I have no idea. I think it's body temperature. Some people think it's, I don't know, hormonal changes, something with the pineal gland. I don't get it. Melatonin levels. Somehow they seem to know when it's nighttime. Bottom line is... Terrific for these patients to do a midnight blood film, which the phlebotomists hate. That is the way to do it. And so here's an example. We've looked at a few of these now, right? So is there a sheath? Yes. Yeah, this guy, you can really see. I like this. I took this photo in London. This guy really has a sheath, right? And so, in fact, if we zoom in, we can see that there's sheathed, but no nucleus. Which are of Bancrofti. Easy. Uh, and if it looked a little bit different, you might say, oh, it could actually be Brugia malei, for example. Oh, in fact, here's an example of Brugia, right? So in Brugia, you've got a sheath, but there's two little nuclei at the tip of the tail. It's going to be a slightly different flavor of lymphatic filariasis. So to make a diagnosis, in general, if in the tropics, patient with fever or any syndrome at all, check a blood film. That's typically the way to start. Now, beyond that, yeah, we have an antigen test that can be run. Um, we don't use this at my lab. We send out for this, and by the time it comes back, I've either decided to treat or not. It's a pain. My friends who do trout med in London do this all the time. I don't have easy access to it. There's a nice ELISA for, uh, it's supposed to be IgG, not OGG, <laughs> IgG4. And that's something that Tom Nutman's lab can run for you as well at the NIH. So again, the ultrasound uh, finding is good. I showed you that classic filarial dance sign. If, based on history, physical, filarial dance sign, blood film, or just your gut instinct, you want to treat these patients, how do you do it? Well, it's interesting. If you're a public health officer working with the ministry, working with the local community, this drug is good stuff. This is DEC, diethylcarbamazine, that's what it looks like. And it can be used on a mass drug administration basis, and it's quite effective. Um, what's interesting is that it goes after the... Um, microfilaria E very well. It's less effective against the adults, unfortunately, and that's an issue because, like I said, it's actually the adults that cause disease in lymphatic filariasis. So DEC, not terrific as a way to calm down the infection in an individual, but if you're trying to break the cycle of transmission within a society, it can be quite helpful indeed. And in fact, um, this is often used uh, on a mass drug administration basis in a way I'll show you that's quite novel. For an individual patient, if I see them, doxycycline. That's what I like to do. Kill the Wolbachia, make them weak, eventually the adults will die. And it's not practical on a massive basis, but for an individual person, it's terrific. There's other things you can do. Albendazole is a good way to go. If in doubt, when it comes to roundworms, try albendazole. Think about bending of a roundworm and say, remember, albendazole is usually a good way to go, but not necessarily as impactful as others. We would always add ivermectin on top of it at the same time. There's other stuff you need to do too, guys. And it's such an art to lymphatic 
filariasis surgeons. Has anybody here seen lymphatic surgery done before? I'm always blown away by this. It's like sewing a fart to a moonbeam, but they know how to do this. And it's just unbelievable where you hook up these very dainty structures and get them to work well. It's a handful, usually every city has one or two great, talented lymphatic surgeons. We have a guy called Peter Nelligan in Seattle. He's terrific. But the bottom line is um, trying to get the drainage to improve is very, very challenging in these circumstances. And so in this one particular case for scrotal hydrocele, physicians in Nigeria would drain the hydrocele and then treat the infection. And they, in this particular case, they reported no true complications out of 301 cases. Uh, you know, they're big operations, actually, and uh, hard for me to believe that it's that good. I wonder about publication bias, etc. The bottom line is there are talented surgeons the world around, and maybe, the, if, I guess if I had this disease, these, these would be the guys I would want to go to see, for sure. They have experience with it. Supportive care is huge. Hygiene is huge. So there's some diseases that are waterborne, and there's some diseases that are water washed. This is what we call a water washed disease. Water washing means if the patient had access to any kind of soap and water, these problems would go away. Not the lymphatic filariasis, but all the super infections, all the staph, all the strep. Just improving soap and water is huge. There's a website called filariasis.org. Eric Otteson, uh, now I think at WHO, was very instrumental in starting this up. Lovely guy. And his idea was, yeah. We should give DEC, we actually put it in the table salt, that's the trick I'm going to show you. All kinds of stuff, but his thought was soap and water. Let's give a bar of soap to every person in every village in Africa and we'll deal with so many of these secondary problems. It's very forward thinking, I think, and terrific. In terms of actually preventing this, remember it's a mosquito that spreads it. So if you're going to go after malaria control, if you're going to try to treat communities for their malaria problem by killing the vectors, you may have the side benefit of dealing with this as well. Any place where there's stagnant water, where the mosquitoes can breed, drain that water. That's true for dengue, that's true for malaria, it's true for so many of these mosquito-borne illnesses. Vector control, absolutely huge. And the other thing to do is DEC in the table salt. So we have iodine in our salt, right, so we don't end up with goiter. When's the last time you saw a goitrous patient in America? I've seen it in Nepal. I mean, it's just so rare, right? Iodine is everywhere, but we still do this. Well, in these areas, they put iodine and DEC right into the cooking salt because they're typically not in parts of Oceania where there's any kind of onchocerciasis. They feel safe about this. And although it's not it's totally great against the adults, it keeps the babies down. It helps break the entire cycle. I just think it's such a cool, cool trick. So if you see a, this is the classic thing, if you see a tire or a flower pot uh, that has a little bit of stagnant water in it, go out and drain that. Any kind of stagnant water pools need to be dealt with. And this is what the next year says, iodized for cooking salt, deck fortified. And I think that is just the coolest thing. And amazingly, it seems to do well with the heat of cooking. You can boil it and the deck remains hearty. Or just simply doing mass drug administration for individual patients can be done as well. So that's the key concepts around filariasis. Several different worms, you catch it by the bite of a mosquito, the adults go into the lymphatics, they cause mechanical blockage, they make babies, and that gets transmitted with the bite of the mosquito, and that comes next. Make your nighttime blood films. The patient just came back, give them a little chance to do their jet lag adjustment, let the worms catch up, and then do your nighttime blood films. And we treat. We treat with DEC uh, or ivermectin plus albendazole if there's onchocerciasis risk, because we're worried about DEC there. And we do all the supportive care, getting people shoes, getting them soap and water, etc., which is just so important. I think prevention, in addition to fly control and mosquito control, it's about periodic deck treatment and administration. Okay, so the three worms we just talked about, I have summarized for you on this slide. And the idea is, I want you to be able to think about them. I would say, how do you catch them? What do they do? And how do I control this for an individual patient on treatment basis? Or if we're in my public health hat? And what are the issues around onchocerciasis and LOA? or onchocerciasis and lymphatic filariasis. A little bit of subtleties there, and as you let this percolate through, review your notes, it'll become crystal clear, I think. But having said so, I think it's probably well and truly time for bladders to be drained, caffeine to be replaced, and questions to be asked. And I think we're supposed to restart right, right at 3. Why don't we make it 3.05 so you guys have time to hit the loop?